Welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Marla Dubinsky from the Icon School of Medicine. Uh, on behalf of CME Outfitters, uh, welcome and thank you for joining us today here and um, live. And uh, we're going to be talking today, uh, focusing on the symposium entitled Back to Basics, Examining Mechanisms of New IBD Therapies. We're going to have a lot more to say around this whole topic. It's not just about new mechanisms, but it's about how we integrate our understanding of where we're going uh, in the field, but also understanding how we use the current therapies and whether or not future therapies, how we'll be using those. So Gil's gonna walk us through um, that um, in detail. So today's CME uh, activity is brought to you by um, CME Outfitters, um, a jointly accredited provider of continuing education for clinicians worldwide. And of course, I wanna tell you that today's program is supported by an educational grant uh, from Janssen Biotech, administered by Janssen Scientific Affairs. I do also want to encourage everyone uh, to join uh, us and encourage you um, to follow us on Twitter, my favorite. Everyone, anyone knows I'm not on Twitter. Um, <laughs> I do have a hashtag, whatever that means. Um, so also to um, look for future CME or CE opportunities, uh, healthcare news, uh, and more. Uh, also, uh, Justin walked you through, but remind you that there uh, are audience around the use of the iPads, which you've already been walked through. You'll have your online platform um, for the, with the iPads, and using today allows you to save the slides, actually, which I think is wonderful. Take notes on the slide, answer polling questions, um, and send us your questionnaire. So please uh, log in and interact with us. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm Marla Dubinsky from the Icon School of Medicine, but more importantly, um, I'm really delighted to be sharing the stage here with um, two of my close friends and colleagues, uh, both Sarah and uh, Gil. So I'm going to ask you, Sarah, to first introduce yourself uh, to the audience. Great. Hi, I'm Sarah Hurst. I'm an associate professor of uh, medicine and an IBD specialist at Vanderbilt University um, in Nashville, Tennessee. And hi everyone, Gil Melmed. I'm at Cedar sinai in Los Angeles and it's really a pleasure to be here and share the stage with Sarah and with Marla. Wonderful. So let's start by setting the stage about what are the learning objectives. Here we, I'm just going to walk you through and I'm going to start thereafter. Uh, each of us are sort of digging into each of these objectives so that we can um, follow along and make sure that we optimize the learnings today. So incorporate evidence-based clinical, biomarker, and endoscopic treatment targets into clinical practice when developing treatment goals for patients with IBD. Then um, we're gonna have uh, some case discussion, which I think is really gonna help with the learning as well that Sarah's gonna lead. Second objective, therefore, surrounding the cases is develop treatment plans based on some of our comparative uh, efficacy and safety data for both the biologic naive and the bio-experienced patients with IBD, which to me is sort of the most important learning part of today because I think as new targets come out, it's gonna be more and more important that we understand what works best first and what works best second. Um, those are, I think, our priorities for today. And then Sarah's gonna uh, remind us how important it is to engage uh, sort of a MDT, or what we're calling here an interprofessional uh, team, to improve patient care, IBD treatment outcomes, and I'd also say um, our professional quality of life. So we're missing that. It's not, it also means that we, in totality, I think, you know, we know there's less burnout also by integrating a multidisciplinary team into the management of these complex patients. So uh, let's start digging in a little bit uh, and get into the story and a reminder of sort of where we came from the importance of where we want to go with our treatments and sort of most importantly the why. So we know for certain that the natural history of inflammatory bowel disease, if we don't treat it appropriately, don't treat it at a biologic level, not just an anti-inflammatory level, but actually getting to the mechanism of the inflammatory cascade, we just get, while we're whack a mole inflammation, we get ongoing bowel wall damage presenting as you know irreversible bowel wall damage and particularly in Crohn's when we're continuing to see, despite now what, 1998 till now, we've had a biologic in our, in our space and we're still keeping our surgeons busy. There's something very wrong about how we're approaching this disease and maybe we're just not understanding the biologic properties of ongoing fibrosis and collagen deposition and maybe we're not quite there. But what we do know 
the earlier we can control inflammation, the less bowel wall damage and the less surgeries. And we're gonna walk through some of um, the data we have on outcomes with mucosal healing and the idea that not only do we have to get early into the weeds about managing these patients, but also to tightly control it once you get there. So you have a target, and we'll talk a lot about treat to target in just a sec, but you have a target, but how do you keep them there? This is not a, all clinical trials are one year. Things don't end after one year of our clinical trials, right? Then the real work begins. And how do we keep people in a deep state of remission? So um, in 2015, the International Organization of Inflammatory Bowel Disease put forth the concept of what we call the STRIDE guidelines. That was what we now call STRIDE 1. We've had STRIDE 2 published uh, in 2021. But essentially in STRIDE 1, there was the introduction of the concept. And this was, you know, seven, eight years ago. So there was already this idea that how do we try and, since our clinical trials, particularly in Crohn's, did not have endoscopy as an outcome for clinical trials for drugs to be approved, can we start putting it out there that we believe as a society and as a community that if you get a North Star goal of mucosal healing, better things happen for patients. So the idea uh, in 2015 was, let's try and achieve a short-term goal of symptom management. We want people to feel better fast, and then sort of have an aspirational goal of some biomarker, maybe. In 2015, Calpro and CRP was actually not thought to be a target that you can use to change treatment. And that's what happened in the latest STRIDE 2 publication, which was we're finally, we actually viewed biomarkers as a target that you can use to actually make a treatment decision, not just say, oh, if the Calpro's up, scope them or do an image. We actually decided that based on the data between 2015 and 2021 for the second publication, which is Stride 2, that, you, that biomarkers became an intermediate goal. So you want symptom improvement, then you want an objective marker of biomarkers, and then at a year, endoscopy and some quality of life measures. That was sort of what was put out in Stride 2. Now, IOIBD loves to think about what acronyms we can use, so SPIRIT became the next sort of gig that we were going after, and SPIRIT was the idea that IBD is not a one-year process, so it goes back to what I was saying, that we often gauge sort of in week 52, this is what happens. Well, there's a lot more to the life cycle of an IBD patient, and the idea was, are we really modifying the natural history of the disease and do we actually impact the quality of life of our patients by achieving endoscopy at year one, symptom improvement within weeks, and then biomarker at midpoint in a, in a trial or in, in clinic? And so the idea was is that we need to start setting goals on disease modification. We can no longer just think controlling disease will change the natural history. So this was the introduction of the concept of disease modification. So just as a reminder, sort of walk you through sort of what I just did, which is the idea that you started with certain endpoints that you should be targeting your treatment for, stride two, you know, declared and stride two came out before we knew what the lab, that there was an end, a drug with Rizinkizumab, for example, that finally had in its label that in order to get approval in Crohn's, believe it or not, since 1998, never had endoscopy as an outcome for Crohn's disease trials. Finally, we had a drug that had to meet the outcome that we suggested eight years ago. So there's sort of always a disconnect between what the group or what all of us as GIs felt was important. So Stride 2 sort of reaffirmed, but also added some biomarkers in. And then the idea was brought, which makes me happy about there was even an inkling that transmural healing, especially with the introduction of ultrasound or bowel intestinal ultrasound, uh, it, any cross-sectional imaging, I should add, but one that you can maybe do at the bedside, this idea that in Crohn's disease, is it possible that we should try and achieve transmural healing? That still remains an area of of discovery and something that everyone is working towards seeing whether stride three should actually have that added. Histologic healing, interestingly, we did dabble that in UC, there's some data to support, and I'll walk you through, that when you have some histology improvement, you actually have better outcomes. Um, yet the FDA guidance that just came out not too long ago that was for, available for public comment said, you don't worry about transmural healing and you don't worry about histologic healing. So although we're moving again, probably ahead of where the regulators are, where we believe will modify the disease, we're not there yet at a 12-month trial. So we got some work to do. And this whole idea of biologic healing, meaning can you actually get gene expression 
data or things that are really at the mucosal or um, submucosal level where you can measure that you've turned on or off those important genes that caused inflammation. So the future is really exciting, but I think more importantly is now we understand that achieving these targets are important. So is there a study or studies that have gone out to see whether or not you, ha you set a goal, you set a mucosal healing target, and you use objective markers, not just symptoms, to make a decision on escalation? This is the COM trial that was run by um, John Frank Columbell here, published already, wow, six years ago, this idea that you randomize people um, who were pretty well within two years of diagnosis, so an earlier cohort, which always earlier is better as we know in terms of efficacy of our drugs, so that makes sense. And you randomize them to go up to, I'll make it, you know, it's a lot more complexity, but the idea you went from every other week at Alimumab to weekly. There was some combo involved and a little bit of switching of the type of combo, but essentially it was, do I use symptoms to declare that my patient could go on weekly, or do I use objective biomarkers to say, you know what, regardless of symptoms, Calpro and CRP are up. And this was the design of the study, looking at a year essentially, what happened. Um, when you look at the, the endpoints, <clears throat> you can see here that you can look at this slide as glass half empty and glass half full. I used Calpro and CRP. I obsessively monitored. I went up to weekly as soon as I could, and less than 50% of my patients met the mucosal endpoint at a year. Depressing? Maybe, maybe there's other reasons for that. Second was there was a p-value significant, but that symptoms alone, about a third of our patients met that target. So how we look at this delta of about 15 and a half percent, could we do better? I think yes. However, the question being is when you look at some of the other endpoints, and this is showing you again, that when you look at deep remission, which was the main, you know, was even more deeper a criteria in terms of the definition of no ulcerations, uh, you can see, again, the deeper that you went, you tend to have some delta, but really, if steroid-free remission was the best we got, and we didn't achieve the, end, the outcome that we're telling people in stride to achieve, the question is, are we meeting unrealistic expectations, or are we missing the point that one therapy alone doesn't solve our problems, which is why, and I know earlier today there was a discussion at the meeting around combo, um, but that'll be for another day. Um, but the idea really is you know, whether or not we could do better and the mechanisms of why we keep he hitting a ceiling. Another study that looked at using maybe uh, a way of deciding whether clinical symptoms alone um, should determine uh, and seeing patients more regularly and having regular measures and seeing patients more often, tighter control, which was the REACT study. And when you look at um, deciding whether or not you should use therapy early with combination therapy versus just sort of go along with how you would normally standard of care, they randomized sites. So this was a cluster randomization. And what I found fascinating is um, not shocking that when you use a subjective marker like the Harvey Bradshaw Index, you don't see a difference. It tells us, like usual, that subjectification of defining when we should use therapies or not, or use or ramp up, however the wording we want to say, or early effective intervention, asking someone how they feel is not going to get you to the end game. So that's why the objectification was such a big play with Stride, but also when we finally now have all Crohn's clinical trials needing to reach an endoscopic endpoint, I think this adds yet another reason why we need to continue to do that. Now, interestingly, um, and these are the sort of across the board, the other, these are the proportion of patients in symptomatic remission out to 24 months. Um, so again, you don't see a significant difference between just waiting for the patients to tell you they should, they need next therapy and starting how we usually approach IBD. And Corey Siegel continues to tell us that every time he looks at data, it still looks like 5-ASAs and steroids are the number one induction therapy for Crohn's disease, both of which are not indicated and both of them don't reduce the rates of surgery still a problem. So clearly we need a lot of work to be done and maybe that's where this treat to target concept sort of was coming about. REACT 2, which was sort of the upgrade version of REACT 1, this idea that we wanted to see whether or not step up care, which I don't like the term, but that's sort of the intonation, versus um, looking and making decisions using endoscopy. 
um, which we said, you know, I just made the comment that you can't use subjective only to make a decision. And here we are, we have this uh, sort of H, you still using the Harvey Bradshaw, but using some endoscopy markers to help decide whether you just use standard treatment approach or whether you enhance your treatment based on endoscopy. And you think, wow, that's a lot of endoscopies who went into this trial, but this was the design of the trial because we said the first one didn't result in any meaningful events. What's interesting, which again makes us all go back and under, try and understand what are we saying, what are we doing, what are we directing here, is this, are we taking a, a, a good enough visibility into what we're recommending here, that even by doing obsessive colonoscopies at the end of the day, it did not look like um, patients made a difference whether you sort of did this accelerated advanced therapy approach. I will tell you that two thirds of the patients went into the trial in remission. So sometimes you have to say, wow, does study design actually impact the outcomes of studies before we say, don't do colonoscopy to make decisions on treatment. So that's my learning lesson, because look at the next slide, is oh, when you actually look at people who had endoscopic ulcerations at the time you start your study, guess what happens? You do better when you use endoscopy to make your decisions to advance therapy. So this was sort of not the primary endpoint, so by definition it failed. But like, like always, we do these sub sort of analysis to try and figure out how is that even possible because in our real world experience, this is not what we see, right? So I think we learn a lot uh, from these studies. And then the next study, um, which is the Stardust study, which was um, that was adalimumab, by the way, that I just talked you through, but Stardust was using ustekinumab, and you could see this complex design around using a treat-to-target to actually escalate therapy versus using your standard of care, let me wait for us to see how you feel, and not using objectification to define your treatment strategies. And here I am babbling around the need to like have an endoscopic outcome, and I'm showing you two negative studies. It's fabulous. So this study, um, uh, the Stardust study also um, didn't really show us that there was a p-value significant difference between objectifying your reasons for escalating therapy versus um, asking the patient how they feel. Um, so I still think, I, I feel strongly that we need to go in this direction and I hope I can convince you with the next set of of slides. So ustekinumab in Crohn's disease, this is just still similar of the Stardust just showing you the fact that across all, pretty well all domains, there was no difference in uh, this mechanism. So the disease modification, I just wanted to highlight for you why we think this is probably the next direction of where we need to go or focus on, is sort of thinking about beyond the year. So we proposed in the spirit, sort of in the spirit of spirit, was the idea that there are other things we need to be focusing on, for example, quality of life, colon cancer, screening, colectomy rates, things that actually don't happen in a year. So that is why we started to sort of map out what else happens after a year and should we think out to five years if we're really going to be thinking about uh, our patient and mortality even made it in there. So what do we know from non-IBD immune conditions? The idea that early treatment this is in MS, that early treatment actually resulted in a reduction in all-cause mortality. So people were shocked when we brought mortality in as a target within five years of why we need to use drugs. And a lot of it was to be sort of provocative that in some of these other diseases, they do talk about mortality as being a target for disease modification. And in RA, they look particularly, um, there was an, an initiative that looked at that you can actually improve patient functioning. Now, Dave Rubin presented this morning this idea of, of sustained functional remission, this concept that we don't talk enough about, again, in thinking about IBD patients. So where do we think that if you get early mucosal healing, despite the two studies that I showed you, what do we know from looking back at data or databases or looking back again retrospectively, we see a couple of data points here showing you that you do use less steroids and we do have reduced rates of surgery. Similarly, we have different outcomes in UC showing that mucosal healing actually correlates with de uh, decreased colectomy rates. So there is a correlation between healing the bowel and longer term, not just in these year short-term studies, that we actually impact the natural history of the disease. 
probably one of the more controversial is really the impact of histology. I'd have to say that I'm a little bit more comfortable than you see with the data, thinking about that histology may matter, some of the work that's been more done of late. Crohn's disease, we're still unsure. I think there's a smattering of data to support that maybe histology, it's a patchy disease. I don't even know what it means. It's a transmural disease. It's different than you see, so I'm still getting around it. And notice in stride, we didn't even put histo for CD. We still had a lot more work to do. There was no evidence to make any suggestion. And this was a nice study actually um, published recently looking at that histologic healing did impact corticosteroid use and hospitalization. So maybe it does impact. Now Dave Rubin also published, I remember him and Britt Christensen looking at that if you had complete normalization, you had less flares than people who had chronic, not active, but chronic, even crip branching versus active obviously were the fastest time to flare. And in the vein of talking about transmural healing, again, whether you measure by MR, CTE, or small bowel intestinal ultrasound, it doesn't matter. It was the concept that you actually, if you get transmural healing, you actually have better outcomes. And it makes sense. I mean, if we're only looking at one of the four layers that are involved in Crohn's disease, particularly the submucosa and the muscularis, which is where all that thickness and hypertrophy contributes to scarring and contributes to obstruction, we need to do better. And so what I want to just present is work, and this is Gil and Corey and Sid Singh and the chorus group, who really wanted to take treat to target to a quality improvement initiative and how does it work in practice and basically and Gil you'll correct me if I'm wrong essentially they wanted to see if you took patients who had active disease at a time point they looked back and wanted to know whether or not any of these three things were discussed in a patient who had active disease and all three had to be met to say you were practicing a treat to target philosophy in your clinic yes I talked about it I, did, I asked Gil, what was the def, was there a script? He said, no script. I just talked about it. Was endoscopy or imaging or CalPro performed within the preceding 12 months? And the third is, was treatment changed, including TDM? Was there actual change in treatment discussed? And what he wanted to say is that once we started quizzing the sites, you could see over time that more sites met this definition and percentage that were actually talking to their patients even the concept of treat to targets so that made me happy, Gil. But you can add some color uh, during the discussion. And I'll end with my slide saying that really, if we want to modify and use the term healing for our IBD patients, and this was in the April volume tome of gastro led by Elsa Hart and Dave Rubin, which was redefining how we think about IBD and setting the stage for the future. And I think this diagram really represents what we need to think about when we're managing IBD patients, which is redefining healy, healing, which includes psychological and emotional healing, as well as our intestinal healing. So I will, I will stop there and sign it over to um, Sarah, who's going to walk us through cases and ask a few questions. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, and please don't forget to um, put questions um, on your iPad or if you're um, tuning in virtually to, um, to we'd love to answer questions. Um, so don't forget to do that. Um, and there may be some questions that, that come in that we'll answer a little bit later as we talk about treatment. Um, and so one question um, that came up is, are you using fecal calprotectin um, as a routine monitoring strategy for everyone? Are there certain patients that you use it for? Um, is it CRP? That's, that's a really great question. Yeah, it's so. a great question. I think what's interesting, COM taught me something interesting, so I'll go back and try and dissect that a little. But what it, it made me realize is that maybe we don't have the right biomarker for small bowel Crohn's. So I just want to set it out there because if we had had a different biomarker, would we have achieved better outcomes? I don't know. Would we have escalated earlier? I don't know. So maybe that's where transmural findings may have come into play a little earlier. So what I do is I do both when I benchmark a diagnosis or benchmark it to an active endoscopy like when I'm at, or active cross-sectional, whatever I'm using to define gold standard activity. And I see which one correlates better. I don't need to do both all the time. In general, it ends up that, as we know, CalPro and UC are a much better fit. We know that. If you have colonic disease and Crohn's, you're going to also see a CalPro fit. 
but CRP tends to be more so with Crohn's because it's transmural. I believe if you have CRP elevation you see, that's a bad prognostic sign because that usually means it's deeper and it's not just mucosal, or you have C. diff, by the way, but, or there's something else going on to give you a high CRP. Um, and don't forget, 30% of folk may not mount a CRP response. So I, I'm curious to see whether there are other biomarkers, but that's sort of the way that I, I dissect which one I choose to monitor. I do it post-induction in everybody. It is my, I follow Stride pretty, pretty closely, and I do it post-induction. And there's a lot of data to say that if you get a CalPro change at the start of your maintenance, it was looked at in vetalizumab, ustekinumab, you actually have a, a CalPro drop or a CalPro less than 100 at week 14 predicted week 52 mucosal healing better than clinical or even the endoscopic finding at the post-induction endpoint. That's very key. Yeah, so there's something about doing, particularly CalPro and UC, I meant, I meant reference, that really I think helps me make some decisions about escalation earlier than later if that, if that helps, yeah. That's great. Yeah. I think also the key of um, that I heard you say about um, sort of benchmarking it with endoscopy or you know imaging or ultrasound, I think is a really great point too. And that's something that I've started to really try to to focus in on. So, thank you so much. All right, we will head to our first case. So this is a patient case, and on your iPads, you should um, after we go through the case. Definitely pay attention because we're going to ask you um, to give us an answer. Um, we will talk about your answer um, because you're going to have another opportunity to answer the question um, after Gil talks, and then we're going to talk through um, the treatment strategy for this patient. So this is Sean, a 28-year-old man with a new diagnosis of Crohn's disease um, with a BMI of 20. And current symptoms are significant. Six month history of abdominal pain, two to three loose stools a day, eight to 10 pound weight loss past three months, daily fatigue, left knee pain, and, um, and this fatigue has been worsening over the past few months. No current prescription medications and no history of treatment with any biologic agents. Um, so Sean's labs, his CRP is elevated at 9.8. His hemoglobin is low at 10.2. His ferritin is low as well. His albumin is still within normal limits and his fecal calprotectin is elevated at 412. His MRE shows active inflammation, distal 20 centimeters of the distal ileal. Uh, distal ileum shows disease, no luminal narrowing, and thankfully no abscesses or fistulas are noted. His uh, his endoscopy score, his CE, or sorry, SESCD score is 12, which indicates moderate endoscopic activity. So this is your chance to respond. So what mechanism of action would you choose when selecting an initial treatment for this patient? An immunomodulator, an anti-TNF, an anti-interleukin, a JAK inhibitor, or you're not quite sure. So with that, I will turn it over to Gil and let, oh, give you a few minutes first to answer. <laughs> um, and then I'll turn it over to Gil. Yeah, this is just what would you do in practice? Not necessarily a right or a wrong. What would you choose? So that's... <laughs> In practice, we can end up giving a patient one drug. So what would you choose? Or maybe more, as we'll talk about, but yeah, right. that'll be later. All right, so um, thanks, Marla, for setting the stage uh, so expertly, as you always do, uh, and, and talking to us about the treat-to-target paradigms. And those paradigms of care, I think, are really important so that we have some framework, some context into which to place any drug that we use for any patient, but of course, Nobody fits, not everybody fits every algorithm, and while we have that context of the algorithm, I think there's also individual considerations that we all have when we start a patient on a new drug. What is the efficacy of that drug, and how do we think about the need for efficacy, rapidity of onset, and some of the pharmacodynamics, the ability to perform TBN, TDM, how does that all fit into this particular patient at this particular time? What about safety considerations? Some patients may be more attuned to safety than others. Some patients may have their own comorbidities that we have to think about, infection risk, cancer risk, in the context of the patient's own preferences or medical history, and how does that play out? 
We also know that there's individual characteristics. Uh, we might treat a, a, a teenager or a 20-something year old very differently than an 80 year old and how do those considerations uh, play out in our choice of therapies as well as other considerations that may relate to the particular individual patient in front of us, access to care, pre patient preferences. These are all coming into play. And then, of course, we have our disease characteristics. Is it Crohn's? Is it UC? What is the labeled indication for the drug? How do we think about the disease severity playing a role here? More on the severe side of moderate to severe than on the moderate side of the moderate to severe where most of our advanced therapies are positioned. And then as far as EIMs and extraintestinal manifestations, how and should they be playing a role in our selection of therapy? So all of these, and it's a complicated consideration that's going through our head in sometimes overt and sometimes covert ways when we think about how to, uh, how to prescribe a medication for a particular patient, such as the one that Sarah introduced us to. So um, as Marla mentioned, um, infliximab, and it's, I had to use my fingers, but I ran out of fingers 25 years ago, right? Infliximab was approved for Crohn's disease, and, but really in the last 10 years, we've had an enormous acceleration of new developments in this area, and we have several um, new agents, several new classes of therapy, and how can we or should we be thinking about the use of these therapies in a particular individual patient? We have the anti-TNFs, IL-1223, JAK inhibitors, anti-integrins, S1P modulation, and now uh, the latest is uh, IL-23 selective inhibition. Um, so if we think about mechanisms, and I just want to highlight to you uh, the framework of mechanism in this slide, um, and I'm going to sort of boil it down to two main features of commonalities among mechanisms. Um, and in the boxes, you can see the particular class of drug. And we have one set of boxes on sort of on the left side of the screen, which all relate to what happens in that interface between what's happening in the lumen, the bacterial exposure, the microbiome exposure at the luminal epithelial level with the intestinal immune system and the various cytokines and chemokines that get triggered and the communications that occur. And so there we have our anti-cytokine therapies, anti-IL-1223, JAK inhibition, uh, TNF modulation, some of which modulate multiple different conversations that are happening in the immune milieu in this space. And on the right side of the screen, we have our anti-trafficking mechanisms. We have anti-integrins, vetalizumab, which, uh, uh, which uh, works by mod modifying how white blood cells, how leukocytes migrate into the lamina propria from the bloodstream, and also our S1P modulation, the new kit on the block in this space, where uh, S1P modulation occurs by also modifying how those leukocytes migrate outwards from the lymphoid system and eventually make their way to the gut. So these are sort of the anti-trafficking mechanisms versus the anti-cytokine mechanisms mechanisms that are uh, uh, inhibiting various components of that inflammatory conversation happening. And then to drill a little bit deeper into, into some of the mechanistic differences that we're now seeing with the emergence of our latest therapies, uh, just to distinguish IL-1223 from IL-23 selective inhibition, which you uh, undoubtedly are hearing a lot about. Eustachinumab was the first drug in this space with eustachinumab targeting a cytokine, uh, targeting the P40 uh, subunit. Of, of that molecule that binds and is common to both the IL-12 and the IL-23 receptors. So by binding that one particular subunit, uh, eustachinumab actually influences and modulates both of those receptors, as opposed to the selective IL-23 mechanism, which targets a different subunit, the P19 subunit, which is selective only to the IL-23 uh, receptor and therefore uh, model modulates a more selective uh, pathway of inflammation. How and should this influence the ultimate efficacy of a drug or the safety of a drug? I think it's really hard to derive from mechanism and maybe we can talk about mechanistic influences on efficacy and safety uh, that will probably be coming out as we learn more how these drugs fare in the clinical space and we'll touch on what we know so far. So what do we know about positioning or sequencing when it comes to one drug relative to another? And in the case that Sarah presented to us uh, for this part of the conversation, it will be around the treatment naive patient or the newly diagnosed patient. So uh, we have um, a little bit of real world evidence and clinical trial data to guide us about the use of one therapy versus another. Um, we have uh, uh, Crohn's disease uh, 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 data that talks about um, positioning one drug versus another, which I'll show you some data for. We have our 
guidelines, which really don't give us a lot of guidance with respect to should we use drug A or B or C in a particular scenario, really the guidelines are sort of structured very loosely to give us a sense, well, yeah, you could use A or B or C, but like what is the positioning amongst them is not really so clear from the guidelines, and we really do need evidence to help guide us in this space. I think we have also a little bit of data after failure of an anti-TNF inhibitor uh, with, with what, do we, what, what do those second line advanced therapies look like. We, we, we definitely see lower response rates after failure of an anti-TNF across the board, but how do those lower response rates translate uh, with respect to differences that we might see with non-anti-TNF therapies? We have data. Uh, looking at ustekinumab after failing an anti-TNF in Crohn's, showing that there is efficacy. We have uh, uh, ustekinumab efficacy after failure of vedolizumab. Uh, we, we see also TNFs uh, can be effective after failing vedolizumab, but perhaps vedolizumab may not be so effective after failure of an anti-TNF. And so the combinations actually become dizzying uh, when we start to think about all the possible ways that we might think about an efficacy of one drug after failure of another drug. So just to sort of walk through what do we know about the basics of some of our different classes of therapies, um, I think everybody in the room probably is familiar with use of anti-TNF therapy as first-line use. Um, we use anti-TNFs. Uh, we've been using them the longest. They have typically a rapid onset of action, uh, rapid onset translating into clinical effects when they work. Um, there is data on fistulizing disease with anti-TNFs that we don't necessarily have with our later classes of drugs. We have also data on the more severe acute patients, particularly severe acute uh, ulcerative colitis in the hospital uh, with the use of anti-TNF therapy. They're effective for a variety of extra-intestinal manifestations, um, many of which can be seen on the labeled indication of anti-TNFs, which have multiple labeled indications as opposed to some of the um, later or newer therapies. Uh, there's a lot of data that we have on safety, especially with now pregnancy registries, and um, we can talk maybe about some of the special scenarios of individual patients and how safety comes into play. Um, TDM, therapeutic drug monitoring, much better defined with anti-TNFs than with any other class. We, talk, we can talk about it with other classes, but really much of the data and certainly the strongest data comes from what we've learned from anti-TNF use of, anti, of uh, therapeutic drug monitoring. And then we have also robust data in the setting of post-operative Crohn's disease, which is yet another patient-specific scenario that uh, we, we need to be thinking about selection of therapies. And then there's a whole bunch of reasons why we might not want to use an anti-TNF up front. We know that that may portend loss of response for the next biologic therapy if there is a loss of response. We know that there are certain medical considerations we need to think about our particular patient. Do they have a history of lymphoma? Do they have active cancer? Do they have infections that we need to worry about with this mechanism? Um, psoriasiform uh, skin reactions continue to puzzle me, uh, you know, with their ability to be used for psoriasis, but yet at the same time seeing psoriasis as not an uncommon skin um, adverse event associated with anti-TNF uh, medications. Uh, they're contraindicated in patients with congestive heart failure or demyelinating disorders. We certainly need to be screening for infections, particularly TB and hepatitis B, before starting, as we do with most of our other advanced therapies. Um, and then, as I'll show you, some of our strongest data with anti-TNF therapy is in combination with thiopurines. And how comfortable are we with that? So I think that also may be a topic of conversation is when we do use anti-TNF therapy is, you know, what is the role of combo? And then, of course, um, the infection risk that is endemic to them. What about ustekinumab? So here's data, and Marla, I think, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm glad you brought this point home that IBD is not a one-year disease um, or, or a, a induction period disease. IBD is a lifelong condition, and so when we show data, it's, it, you know, we, induction data can look very impressive for a lot of drugs. What we really want is long-term outcome, long-term data for the drugs that we can, especially those drugs that have been out long. So this is just data from the ustekinumab uh, program uh, looking at um, differences across uh, two different doses of maintenance used to kinumab, showing that uh, patients do have robust clinical response with various definitions used on the left side of the screen for outcomes at one year. And then also on the right side of the screen, showing you that there still are differences in used to kinumab outcomes with respect to patients who are previously exposed to anti-TNF therapy. So on the right side of the screen, the left 
bars are patients uh, who previously failed or were exposed to anti-TNF drugs as opposed to on the right side, the, all, the extreme right of the screen, where we have our patients who are enrolled based on intolerance or non-response to conventional therapy, and those bars are higher, again, suggesting that when you start with an anti-TNF, maybe you are influencing what happens to subsequent bi biologic use. And here we have ustekinumab data out to five years. So this is now beyond our usual one year of clinical trials, also very reassuring uh, that, they, that the response rates uh, maintained over five years are still, when we think about it, relatively high. On the other hand, I think it also poses to us um, a, a suggestion that we still have room to go, that with one of our best drugs, we still are seeing maybe 46% of patients that were able to stay on drug throughout this time period still um, in, in clinical remission. Uh, but what about the rest of the patients? Um, that, that haven't met that. And again, on the right side of the screen, showing the differences between those that were previously exposed to anti-TNF therapy versus those that were not, um, with, with differences there, and again, setting up the question about positioning. Uh, what about rizinkizumab? Marla touched on rizinkizumab as a la our latest therapy. This is an IL-23 uh, selective inhibitor, and what you can see here is robust clinical data for rizinkizumab clinical outcomes, clinical remission, stool frequency, abdominal pain, and very importantly, um, very robust data, as Marla touched on, for endoscopic response. Uh, and, and, and seeing those numbers really um, are, are very remarkable numbers uh, demonstrating the efficacy of this drug. Um, we don't have, those are 52-week data. It would be great to see what longer-term data also continue to look like and how long those results continue to hold. But uh, very reassuring from what we've got so far. And what about relative efficacy of one relative to another? And we, again, we don't have a lot of data in this space, but what we have, uh, we, 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 we have something to learn from. So this is, uh, this is actually a study that is just published this month. Uh, this is retrospective data, observational data from Germany, um, where patients were uh, followed when started on either uh, ustekinumab or anti-TNF therapy and uh, what happened over time. And what you can see from this registry is that there are very similar outcomes, very similar outcomes between anti-TNF and ustekinumab when started um, on one of these two drugs. And when you look at the bio-experienced patients, again, there were actually similar outcomes. And so, uh, you know, when we think about positioning, this is some of the evidence that we have to consider as part of our um, a part of our armamentarium. Then we have our CVU study. CVU study was a study that looked at adalimumab versus ustekinumab. Uh, so we have a head-to-head -head trial, one of our very few uh, uh, published head-to-head -head trials now for uh, in the IBD space, and we'll touch on the other one. This is a multi-center randomized uh, controlled study where these are bio-naive patients failing or intolerant to conventional therapy who had active inflammation on colonoscopy. And they were assigned to receive ustekinumab at standard doses or adalimumab. And what you can see in the outcomes is that the results are similar. Um, and so this also would be considered a, a, a negative study in terms of determining that one drug is better than another, uh, but I think also reassuring that the, that the data and the um, results that were seen in the clinical trials hold up in this follow-up study, that both of these drugs are highly effective in patients with uh, Crohn's disease. Um, and this is also persistent out to looking at out at week 52. And while on the subject of comparative effectiveness in a head-to-head -head trial, we do have a trial in ulcerative colitis, and this is uh, the Varsity trial where vedolizumab was looked at compared to adalimumab for patients, some of whom, up to 20%, were actually allowed to be exposed to prior anti-TNF therapy. Um, and what this study showed, unlike what we saw in the Crohn's study, was that there was a, a difference, there was superiority um, determined between one drug and another, with vedolizumab having greater efficacy with overall greater clinical remission rates uh, as compared to adalimumab. But importantly, and this is, comes back to our prior conversation about prior exposure to anti-TNF therapy, that difference between adalimumab and vedolizumab, that superiority, so to speak, of vedolizumab really was apparent in the patients who were anti-TNF naive. And those with prior anti-TNF exposure, that difference really went away. And so, again, how can we or should we be thinking about that kind of positioning in patients with prior anti-TNF exposure? So let me hand it back to Sarah for continuing with our case. Yeah, thank you. That was incredible. Um, I think we've all learned a lot. We have a ton of questions to get through as well. Um, so let's redo the question. So if you all want to see if your ideas have changed after listening to um, 
really a tour de force around um, these treatment strategies. Uh, again, what mechanism of action would you choose when selecting an initial treatment for this patient? Immunomodulator, anti-TNF, anti-interleukin, a JAK inhibitor, or you still don't know. All right, so um, this is great. I think we've seen some changes in what people think um, about what they would be interested in or I think would be available for this patient. Um, bef before we did this, a lot of, patient, a lot of people were thinking anti-TNF. Um, and after listening to Gil, we've got some more interest in interleukin, which is, which is really great. Um, and so I, I want to dig into, there's so many questions, so, and a lot of it really is around this bio-naive patient, so I'm going to start with some of these questions, if that's all right with everyone. So the first one is um, a, a great question, and, and it um, involves anti-drug antibody development in the IL-1223 class. Um, so what it, is there differences between these classes as far as that's concerned? Um. Sorry, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that any biologic drug uh, will have the possibility of developing anti-drug antibodies. And I think the question is, how does the development of those anti-drug antibodies influence response? Does that interfere? And maybe it does, and maybe it doesn't. And maybe there's nuances in the types of antibodies and how they're measured. Um, we do definitely see with infliximab higher rates of anti-drug antibodies, and I think more clearly a correlation with the uh, presence of anti-drug antibodies affecting drug clearance in an adverse way. Um, and I think we are mu I'm, we're much more comfortable with understanding um, the mechanism of anti-drug antibody formation in that context and utilizing that information to make clinical decisions. I'm, uh, the, the rates of anti-drug antibody formation with ustekinumab are much, much lower um, than, than we see with infliximab, even with adalimumab, although they're very low with adalimumab as well. I'm trying to think if I've, I've clinically seen it or actually used it to, to drive clinical decision making, and I'm really struggling to think of a particular scenario. I don't know if um, anyone else wants to comment on that. Uh, it's, it's very, as you noted, Vetalizumab and ustekinumab, so let's say the non-TNFs and even rizinkizumab now, I think it occurred less than 4% and none were neutralizing. So that's important because we don't know a lot about the data about Riza, but that, that is the case. So outside of TNF, it does not appear that they're impacting the exposure response, which is what we're talking about. Does the drug concentration or, uh, and or presence of antibodies impact the outcome that we wanted to see granted in the trials, um, and there is some post-approval, you know, post real world, but the studies are suggesting that because of the low immunogenicity, I'm talking less than 2% for USTA and less than 4% for VITO, and I just talked about rizinkizumab, that is why there's a belief that, and you mentioned the combo story, is that outside of TNF, to be fair, even though the trials didn't mandate you were on an immunomodulator plus, and when we talk combo, it's getting complicated because you're gonna, you're gonna yeah. show a little bit about combo biologics, combo small molecule plus, or dual biologic, whatever we're gonna call it moving forward. When we talk about combo in the context of this, we're talking about either methotrexate or a thiopurine, for example. And the data really shows two things, that it does not appear that you need combination therapy with the non-TNF biologic, which adds to the safety and maybe why you also saw a little bit of a move, so that's interesting. And also um, that it's not impacting the outcome of, of the efficacy, and I think that does move the needle on our understanding about if we can use a drug as monotherapy that has the efficacy that you showed me in the right patient population, why am, again, am I making this more complicated than it needs to be? And it looks like the response is sort of echoed that. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, I think that's really key. And I, I think it's, I don't think we can minimize that importance because if you're starting an anti-TNF, I think we really, like, when we think about starting an anti-TNF, you really have to think about how you're gonna deal with anti-drug antibodies. Are you gonna be someone who's going to be, a, 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 I think one of the things I think about, if you're gonna use monotherapy, I think there's, you know, there's still probably people have differing opinions on this, but for me, that person probably really, you need to be looking at drug levels, and I would favor doing it as early as possible. And if that, but you have to think about if that's available in your practice. 
And, and again, also if they have really significant disease, should they be on combination therapy? We definitely have, have significant data that shows that anti-TNF with, with azathioprine really has differential benefit in patients with Crohn's disease and early on in ulcerative colitis. So, so the practice pattern for you that I think is really important to think about is, are you gonna start with an anti-TNF and azathioprine? Um, or you, if you're gonna try monotherapy, do you have the availability to be doing drug monitoring early? I think where I struggle is perianal disease, to be fair. Yes. Because you really don't have a lot else than particularly infliximab being the only drug ever, you know, randomized control trial looking at fistula healing or response. So I struggle to say that in, we know that that's a very difficult phenotype to address. And is that a segment of the population where we're just going to try and get as high a drug concentration, whether we believe that a second drug is there because it enhances the, it has its own effect uh, on efficacy, or is it there to help improve the TNF drug concentration? Unclear. I think Sonic didn't clear that up for us, so we're still debate. But given that, you know, some of the data and meta-analysis suggests that thiopurines may be effective for perianal, again, never done in a controlled, et cetera, et cetera, that maybe that's the one place where people feel this affinity to combo. But everything else, I think you, you say you have to do exactly. There's two roads. Either you obsessively, proactively uh, use TDM and induction, or you go with combo. It's a pretty... I think there's two roads. I'm not sure there's, there's much in between. Right. And yeah. I, I think, speaking to the, the, the ba back to basics, examining mechanisms, I mean, the question was about antibodies, anti-drug antibodies to non-anti-TNF drugs. I don't think all anti-drug antibodies are the same. I think we've learned with anti-TNF therapies that we do have a clear association between the presence of antibodies and loss of response or, um, or potential safety concerns with infusion reactions. Whereas with other drugs, I just don't think the data bear that out. And that translates to do we or don't we think about combination therapy with these anti-TNF drugs, yep. which we do not need to think about with the yep. others. Right. I think that's a really important key. When you're thinking about this for your patients, um, that's one thing that I really think a lot about is how, how, well, am I going, how well are they going to want to be monitored? And, and so I think that, you know, that plays into what kind of, of, of medication you're going to think about for them as well. So many questions coming in. Um, one question is, um, how about TDM with these newer drug, drug classes? Um, and I think, uh, I, think we've, I think you talked about it pretty well, uh, uh, quite a bit. Um, it, to me, I think we need to learn a little bit more about this personally. But um, uh, because of the low antibody development, um, to me, that, that proactive drug monitoring need is not there personally and, for me. And what can you really do, right? right. You're limited by the label, number one. It's, it's really difficult to get more optimized dosing for, for drugs that are non-TNF these days. And you're gonna go by your clinical acuity. Endoscopically, there's still activity. Do I switch or do I optimize that class, regardless of whether they have an antigen? You know, because of the low immunogenicity, I think we're gonna just move forward with either switching or escalating in the non-TNF therapies. Yeah. Empirically. Empirically, yeah. 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 Great, there's a really great question about um, in this, in um, an older patient population, and, and would that change anything that we would think about um, if this patient was 65 or 70? Um, would that change yeah. our thought process at all? Um, yeah, sure. So I'll, I'll, I'll start. I mean, I think that, and by the way, I, we, I think we really do feel that there isn't an absolute right answer to the question. I mean, we saw some shifts in how people prescribed perhaps initially before the lecture about, um, you know, more anti-TNF prescription and then more uh, interleukin prescription later afterwards. But I, I don't think it's necessarily a slam dunk. And I think in many cases, anti-TNS may be a, a appropriate or preferred first line. But when it comes to an older patient, that's where I really start to um, be concerned about the potential risks. We know everything gets worse as you get older um, in terms of risks and side effects and potential downsides of therapy, including infection risk, including lymphoma risk. Mm -hmm. And those really are, I think, um, safety considerations with anti-TNF therapy that we are, I'm just not as concerned about with um, anti-interleukin therapy, anti-L1223, anti-23, vetalizumab. So in an older patient, um, I try not to start with an anti-TNF. I try not to even prescribe an anti-TNF if I have one of those other options available. 
Yeah, that's, that's a great point. I do, I, we, we looked at this. I mean, I do think one of the things we are worried about is safety at, at you know, single center study. We, we went and looked at this and we didn't, and, and other studies have shown not much different, yeah. in, difference in safety between anti-TNF and, and those studies were with vedolizumab. But one thing I thought was important is that we did see that our patients stayed on vedolizumab longer. We had longer persistence of therapy and now that's a, a single center, but just in sort of my clinical experience, that's, that's been, something that I've seen as well in, in my ulcerative colitis patients. Um, in some, someone was asking, is there any difference when you're thinking about drug levels between the assays, um, between different? I, this is a question I get every day, by the way. So um, we're gonna talk about within TNFs because I think we've all yes. concluded the rest doesn't matter. But for particularly Infliximab, I'll start even more with that, where I do differentiate that that's a drug you need proactive a lot of, um, is that unless it's, truthfully, unless it's a two-phase sort of mobility shift assay, which Prometheus Labs is sort of the only one who has that mechanism, um, where they separate drug concentration from antibody, they're not interdependent, and they could tell you that um, one or the other. The others, even though they may be drug tolerant, they go down to a nanogram level, so not a microgram. So I remember when my fellows were telling me that they were switching everybody off of infliximab to adalimumab for an antibody level of 100. And I said, 100 on what assay? And they said, oh, Arup or LabCorp. I said, that's one. Why did you just switch that patient? So just remember that the only l way that I can, the data shows that if it's above 10, in the mobility shift assay world, that is difficult to overcome. So if you had to pick a number, 10 seems to be. If it's above 1,000 and there's no drug concentration in any other lab, that does get complicated. An antibody level of 480 does not mean you need to switch off drug, and that is where things have gone off the rails. So I'm hoping that I clarified that the assay, good question, um, but you do need to know nanogram versus microgram and then work backwards and say, is there drug? If there's drug, that antibody is not as meaningful. Very, another important point, yeah. That's, it's a big TDM question today, know, which is that's so many. Uh, nothing to do with your talk, by the way. Um, <laughs> mechanisms, mechanisms. Oh, mechanisms. All right, and um, just, we gotta keep, I'm gonna keep us on task, so um, two more questions, and uh, that we've had several questions sort of surrounding the idea of, um, IL-1223, IL-23, what happens if I use it first and then they're gonna use anti-TNF after, um, and the same for vedolizumab. Good question. Great question. Yeah, so you wanna take it? So I was gonna say that, funny, there was a study done out of Canada with Brian Bresler's group uh, who looked at this question. Granted, not in a clinical trial setting, it's on you know, standard of care practice across a large group of Canadian sites. And they actually seen that TNF, after one of those two, the majority was veto. They didn't have, USTA hadn't been out for a very long time by the time they you know, were publishing. And TNF looked to work the same second as it did first. So that's what we have from sort of that. There have been other sequencing publications, single center experiences that have similarly shown that TNF second looks to be agnostic to the cytokine suppression upstream from what it was, and that makes sense. Just as a reminder, biologically, all roads lead to TNF. It is the effector phase at the end game, just like COVID, the end game was TNF. Everything is at the end. So does it really matter if you're blocking lymphocytes from coming and attaching to a receptor on the endothelial? Unlikely. Does it matter if you go upstream to TNF and block 12 and 23? Unlikely, as long as TNF is a part of the process. And if you don't control 12, 23, and that blockade didn't work, you're ha gonna have TNF in the system. So I think if you understand the biology of it, it makes sense that you weren't really seeing a difference. So, so. I, I agree with you. Yes? Oh. But I will okay. also throw in a but. I always <laughs> agree with Marla. <laughs> That's how I got this far. Yeah. <laughs> um, still <laughs> <laughs> but I also think there's something to be said for your second drug means that you've failed one drug, you've probably got worse disease, you've been on probably steroids longer while the, figuring out that that drug didn't work, it's more period of time, so you're not as early in your disease course. I think there's other unmeasured factors with that next drug. Yes, biologically, maybe TNF has an advantage in that way that you described, but 
you know, the, I, I think the next drug and the next drug and the next drug are each going to carry with them a lower likelihood of overall response just because we're seeing a more refractory patient population. Especially in Crohn's because as you're not hitting yeah. this collagen deposition problem or remodeling, as you're wasting time going through the cascade of cytokines, that's where the question is going to be, will some of the future targets come in and replace going after TNF, to be fair, uh, as second or in combination, which, you know, you'll get to some of those. But I think that is a mystery that does need to be answered. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, okay. I think we will go next case on to our next case. Oh, and this is our review. We'll skip through that because we did this comprehensively. Maybe. There we go. So this is uh, Cecilia. She's a 27-year-old woman with a nine-month history of severe steroid refractory pan ulcerative colitis. And someone asked a question about this, so we're going to actually have a case about it. Um, so she was hospitalized. She was started on infliximab with minimal response to um, steroids. She's currently on 10 mg per kg of infliximab every four weeks with a trough level of 16, um, so a, a good uh, drug level, no drug antibodies, and she's been steroid-free for three months. However, she's starting to have symptoms again, three to four stools per day. You scope her, she has Mayo 2 proctosigmoiditis and her fecal calprotectin, while lower is still elevated. So what would we do next Oops, for her? This is not the right question. Uh, sorry, sorry, the question was updated, so yes. I'm going to take chair prerogative to give you some other options here. <laughs> okay. Do you mind? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> just to make sure, because I want to make it fair and, yes. and balanced. Oh, here, here we is. go. There Great. We go. Thank you. Um, so continue infliximab and just recheck some levels. Start adalimumab. Start a JAK inhibitor. Start ustekinumab. Start an S1P receptor modulator or start betalizumab. This just goes to show you how advanced we've been, and you see over the last year or two that we forget that we have all these all these therapies. It's this pretty is amazing, amazing yeah. really, to, to be in a space where we have all these <laughs> options. We're now down to F, A through F, yes. when it was just A, B, or C, so we've yeah. progressed, yeah. Soon to be A through G. Soon to be, yeah, that's right. Probably. Right. Okay. We'll go, study yeah, this. We'll go study over this in our dreams, answers in this, a bit. This slide, <laughs> very important. Right, exactly. So the point of showing this slide, I think, is almost to the point that we, Marla just made about our multiple options. And how can we possibly think about positioning A versus B versus C in any rational way? Uh, doing head-to-head -head clinical trials is very expensive, takes a long time. And, um, and it's going to be years before we have them. And as we do them, more and more drugs are coming out. So, so how do we think about this? And what, what, can we, what tools can we use to guide at least a little bit in distinguishing one drug from another? And so one tool is this concept of a network meta-analysis. And I just want to frame very briefly what a network meta-analysis is. All of our drugs to date are approved on the basis of looking at that drug, versus placebo. And if you look at drug A versus placebo, and then you look at drug B versus placebo, is there some commonality we can draw between those two placebo arms, assuming the trials are somewhat similar, although we can talk about that. And then we can indirectly measure A, drug A effects versus drug B effects, because we know what drug A's effects are relative to placebo. We know what drug B's effects are relative to placebo, so we can somehow connect drug A to drug B indirectly. And that's what a network meta-analysis, by doing this on a grander scale, comparing all the drugs to each other, utilizing those common arms. And so what we see here, when we perform this network meta-analysis, and there have been a few that have been done, um, and, and, and they keep getting updated, um, is, is trying to understand understand the relative efficacy, and we'll also talk about relative safety on the next slide, of one drug versus another. And actually, what we're seeing here on this particular one, and I just want to call your attention to some key features here. On the x-axis um, is I can't even read it, endoscopic improvement, and on, on the y-axis is um, is clinical remission. And so there are actually two different outcomes that we're looking at with respect to this network meta-analysis comparison. And without looking at the details, in the orange diagonal 
boxes are all the different drugs. At the upper left is upadacitinib, and then ozanamod, filgotinib, filgotinib at different dose, tofacitinib, etrolizinib. All of the UC drugs are listed in that diagonal panel. And the colors, the colored boxes, the blue boxes, are intended to show us where there is evidence indirectly, again, with this network meta-analysis, there's evidence that one drug looks like it's better than another. And the common theme that I would just draw your attention to from this slide at least is that there's one drug if you go across all the boxes at the top and all the boxes on the y-axis on the left are blue and that is upadacitinib. So upadacitinib relative to any of the other medications seem to seems to confer some efficacy superiority both with respect to clinical remission and with respect to endoscopic outcomes. There are also a few other scattered blue boxes that you can see in this grid, and that's reflecting some differences that we might see, uh, for example, of advantages of um, ozanamod over forgottenim, et cetera. So this is not intended to walk through all of these boxes, but that this is one tool, and what we learn from this tool is perhaps a superiority seen with this particular drug relative to others. We also have um, network meta-analyses looking at safety. And here the x-axis is serious adverse events and the y-axis are adverse events. So these are two different outcomes. And what you can see here is for the most part there's no blue boxes, which is great. Uh, that these, we can be assured that all of these drugs are relatively similar with respect to safety, although there may be some signal that we see specifically with respect to vetalizumab as perhaps uh, conferring a safety advantage um, over others, in particular golimumab. But if we actually look at the numbers of where those relative risks lie, we actually do see higher numbers relatively with upadacitinib. That same drug that conferred the efficacy advantage may actually have um, some safety signals that are higher, but don't quite make it to make it to a level of a blue box that would show up on this grid. What about Crohn's disease? So here's a network meta-analysis looking at bio-naive Crohn's disease and basically showing uh, no strong blue boxes other than compared to placebo, which is at the end. Of course, every drug is going to be um, uh, uh, looking better than placebo. But if we look at some of the actual numbers, the highest numbers in the boxes are infliximab plus a thiopurine. So that combo therapy that we talked about earlier maybe does confer an efficacy advantage, at least when applied using this particular methodology, with also advantages seen with adalimumab plus ethiopurine, adalimumab alone. And then in the next, uh, in the next uh, uh, box here with this network meta-analysis of Crohn's therapies in bio-exposed patients uh, that we're seeing high numbers with risenkizumab, uh, and used to kinumab relative to uh, adalimumab and vedalizumab. And so can we or how should we, and we can talk about how do we implement or utilize this information as part of clinical practice and clinical decision making, I think it's for each of us to think about. This is not a head-to-head -to -head -to -head trial, but this is trying to make the best of the data that we have um, it, with respect to published, uh, med published data on medications that we use. And then on the safety side for Crohn's disease, uh, we also see that some of our more effective therapies actually may have uh, more considerable safety considerations, for example, like infliximab plus ethiopurine relative to adalimumab alone. What about uh, the durability of uh, how long somebody stays on therapy as another way of getting a sense of uh, relative efficacy of a drug. Um, Sarah, I think you mentioned that persistence on therapy is a way that we can actually determine that somebody's probably doing well on a drug, because why would they stay on the drug if they're not doing well on it? And they're probably not having a major side effect from the drug, because why would they stay on the drug if they're not having a side effect, right? So uh, why would we take them off? So persistence or durability on a drug may be some surrogate way of us to estimate the likelihood of a drug's safety and efficacy sort of all in one. Uh, and this was, this was a study uh, that looked at the durability in patients started on ustekinumab or vetalizumab after failure of an anti-TNF. This is an observational study. And what this showed was that the durability of ustekinumab in Crohn's disease seems to be greater over a period of time, this is over five years, relative to vetalizumab, that patients are more likely to stay on ustekinumab than vetalizumab after failing an anti-TNF. And then moving on, and we sort of teased you earlier about combination therapy. Well, what about combination therapy with biologics? And this is like next level stuff, right? <laughs> so I think that there's a lot of 
questions around this. There's you know, payment considerations. But what do we know about the biology and what do we know about the, about the data that's out there? So there certainly is a rationale for combining therapy. Uh, we know that, that single agents certainly have a lot of room for improvement. Even our best single agent therapies still have significant proportions of patients in the clinical trials that do not respond. Um, we know that there's multiple, um, as I showed you in the cartoon of, of the um, mechanisms of inflammation. There's multiple pathways of inflammation, so it's rational to think that by blocking more than one pathway, we may achieve greater efficacy. And we also know that we have a lot of now options for different mixing and matching of, uh, of different mechanisms in order to perhaps achieve better th uh, therapeutic efficacy. And so when we think about combinations in IBD, we're trying to make some rational considerations for which therapies might we use, a ustekinumab with a vedolizumab perhaps because of favorable safety profiles, anti-TNF with vedolizumab perhaps with a very sick UC patient, and again, a vedolizumab with a, with a safety profile that we discussed. Ustekinumab plus an anti-TNF, also rational thinking, um, or vetaliz vetalizumab with a small molecule like tofacitinib. There's some data out there um, suggesting, again, two very different mechanisms, and again, not really piling on two drugs with safety concerns um, so that we can perhaps um, optimize the efficacy when we combine advanced therapies. And there's a lot of reasons why we might think there's rational use for combination advanced therapies. Um, and again, we touched on, on some of them. Um, and, and there may be different ways we could think about it. Um, maybe hitting two targets at once, two targets which have nothing to do with each other, but if target one achieves a certain level of response and a, a knocking out a mechanism two achieves a certain level of response, maybe additively we're going to get better response rates. Maybe synergistically they're going to work better together. Um, maybe there's a scientific rationale to think, well, if we block this mechanism, we will actually achieve greater efficacy from that mechanism by blocking an alternative pathway that may feed into that mechanism. And so there's a lot of different rationales as to why and how we think about combinations of, of advanced therapies. Um, and I'm going to show you just data from one study, the VEGA trial, or I like to think of it as the Vegas trial because they, you know, maybe hit the <laughs> jackpot here uh, with this concept of combining biologic drugs. And this was a randomized prospective trial where patients received golimumab, an anti-TNF monotherapy, guselkimab, which is an anti-IL-23 anti selective inhibitor, or the combination of the two. And they had an induction period and then followed them out to 38 weeks. Um, and after that induction period, then they went on to monotherapy with golimumab or guselkimab. And uh, what they showed was, uh, look, at these, look at these results. So at 38 weeks, clinical remission was significantly higher in the combo biologic arm. And this is now 38 weeks. We're used to seeing these you know, for induction period, but now we're seeing this um, all the way out there to 30, uh, 38 weeks. And again, they just used the combo for that induction period, and then they went to monotherapy. Um, and so we're seeing that, um, that the uh, effects of, of combo therapy actually persisted at least out to week 38. Um, and we're also, you know, with uh, improvements also uh, persistent with endosco endoscopy um, as well as histology, although symptomatic remission were high in pretty much all the arms. Uh, and so what we're seeing here is a suggestion that combination biologic therapy may carry with it, maybe just for an induction period, maybe for a short period of time, uh, significant efficacy advantages. And, and by the way, on the safety side, there were no differences in safety safety signals that were seen across these three arms of any specific consideration. So maybe we can benefit on the efficacy side without compromising on the safety side. So um, I think this would be a very interesting to see where, where things go in this space. And of course, there's a lot of questions about our ability to access these kinds of uh, manipulations of drugs. Well, thank you so much. Um, we will answer this uh, question again now with um, a lot of robust data with network meta-analyses um, that we just went through and see what, what people think. Okay, so again, some change in some knowledge base, which is, uh, and just different ideas um, after uh, what Gil went through, which is really interesting and great to see. So um, prior, to, um, prior to the discussion, people, some people would continue to, to continue infliximab, and a few people were going, um, 
uh, and, and we, afterwards we see a lot more people thinking about JAK inhibitors and going out of class, um, which I think is really great to see. I think um, for myself, um, for, this, for Celia, uh, I think some of the keys here is she had an adequate drug level, um, so I think, and she's not doing well. She has, as, as Marla talked about, she's not in remission. And um, we need to be, this is a, a space where we need to be proactive um, because she's not going to do well long term if we continue to let her have active disease. And so um, adalivimab to me would not be the place to go because she's already failed this mechanism of action of anti-TNF. Um, and so I think there are several options um, for this patient. Um, and for me, I think uh, the strategy of an IL-1223 or a JAK inhibitor would be um, the places I would likely go next. And I think that really becomes a discussion with the patient. This is really where um, you can, I don't know if it's personalized medicine, but you need to, to have this discussion with the patient. She's 27. Where, where is she thinking in, in, term, in terms of her uh, life? Is she interested in childbearing? You know, these are things that you have to start thinking about when you're thinking about drug classes. So those would be the two things I would start thinking about. I don't know about you. Yeah, my radar went off, of course, she's a 27-year-old <laughs> woman. Right. And I see that uh, UPA is at the top of the list. And Gil made a great way of telling us every box was blue, which means everything was significant. And that is true in trials. And then the patient sits in front of you. And everything that you learned or thought about may become null. No. No. And you have to sort of say to yourself, all right, so she's, you know, she's improved. I'm going to, I'm not, she's still symptomatic. She's got Mayo 2. She's got some urgency. If we don't heal this, it's not going to end well for her and it will just get worse. So really the, what I look at, when I look at these network meta and there's some matched indirect comparison data well that has been out there. And I think what I group it in is that what looks to be agnostic to TNF failure from what Gil showed us? Ustekinumab, based on the unified data, looks to be somewhat agnostic. Listen, everybody does better if you hadn't failed a TNF, okay, no matter what. However, the delta between placebo and drug was not that significantly different in, na in those patients who were naive or exposed in UNIFI, which is the USTA UC trial. So I'll start with that. So it looked to be agnostic. The JAK inhibitors definitely look also similarly to be agnostic to whether you failed a TNF. So already I have two categories that I'm thinking about, and I have a 27-year-old here, woman who make it complicated, just got married and wants to have kids. So I've added that layer of what goes into your brain at that moment. Um, and vetalizumab definitively is affected by prior TNF. There is absolutely no role for adalimumab. Even in naive, it's the least effective UC drug, yet still the most prescribed. Something does not make sense here in our world, just like I talked about Crohn's, something doesn't make sense. Something is disconnected here. And um, the S1Ps, to be fair, um, there were more naives in the trial than there were exposed, so it, that could influence, but it definitely looks better in naives. And the IL-23 for UC, which is mirkizumab, which is not approved yet, if you do look, it does look to be um, in induction slightly better in naives. So you see where I'm starting to go with this as I make my list. And then um, I think I covered them all, right, all the ones yes. that are currently available. Okay, yes. so that's how I start my, my thought process. I then say, how much urgency is there, literally? Is there a need for speed? Do I have a bridge of Entecord, or do I have a, does she need steroids? You know, this is what goes into my brain. Do I have a minute? If she, she's only three to four, I'm not saying this is a problem, but mild to moderate, could use some rectal and you could bridge her to another biologic because she wants to get pregnant. I'm telling you, door number one. If pregnancy is not on the table and there's, she's eight to 10, a failing rectal, refuses rectal, steroid refractory in the outpatient world. There's not even a discussion of what your next move is. That is upadacitinib. There is a need for speed, right? We didn't talk about speed, but within one day, overnight, an overnight sensation, your patient doesn't have rectal bleeding. It's true. It does happen. Mm -hmm. Not in everybody. It's about 20%, but it is a possibility. So I think for me, it's the need for speed that drives my, my next choice and whether I have a minute. I say a minute, do I have a bridge of something? Or do I use both? So in my women who I know want to get pregnant, I may start with a JAK inhibitor and then bridge them 
get them off steroids, get them in remission, and then bridge them to an IL 1223 in the space because that's the only thing. I've done that many, many times, and that tends to be, remember, as opposed to jacks, which the minute you sort of stop them, there's a very, very fast half-life, and they're pretty well out of the body very quickly. With ozanamod, it's, it could take three months for full elimination, which is why I'm not putting this at the top of my list, although the data is good and I'm not, I'm not dismissing it, but I'm really thinking about what's my forever drug with this individual who may or may not want to, ha want to have children, so am I going to withdraw something? So that's what goes through my head. I don't know, Gil, if you have any added sort of thoughts around this particular case. Yeah, I, I think that it's tough, um, with, particularly with young women and pregnancy considerations. Um, you know, I think that my go-to probably would be a JAK inhibitor in this scenario uh, because of that likely more rapid response. Um, but, but we definitely need to be thinking about other considerations that may be patient-specific, like pregnancy. Um, I did want to make one point about JAK inhibitors because in the first case that we discussed, which was a Crohn's naive patient, there were some audience responses that put JAK inhibitor there. And I just want to make the point that um, JAK inhibition is only for patients who've previously been on an anti-TNF according to the label. I just want to put that out there. We should not be thinking or talking about use of JAK inhibitors in a naive patient or before the use of anti-TNF therapy. So in this particular scenario, definitely important. But if this scenario was, let's say, somebody with UC who failed vedolizumab, that's a different scenario where I think uh, JAK inhibition would not be on the table per label, so we do need to think about um, some of the other considerations like an anti-TNF or IL-1223. Yeah, so I hope that provided some clarity because I think you first have to di put the patient in front of all this data and say whether I need to pivot a little because of certain. Now, I thought you were gonna say, um, we talked about 27-year-old woman. I was gonna ask you a 65-year-old male whose BMI is 30-something, um, and is a smoker. Yeah, I, that's a great um, segue, I think, to, to what you're saying, is that think about the patient. So, um, you know, his BMI is elevated, he's a smoker, so he's got risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Um, certainly, um, in the black box warning, we need to think about for uh, all JAK inhibitors, relates to thrombosis risk and myocardial infarction and PE, so this would be something I would be, somebody I would be hesitant to put on a JAK inhibitor from a safety consideration. So we've been focusing on the efficacy, getting somebody better quickly and the need for speed to get them well, but of course we need to balance that against yeah. the safety, it's particularly in somebody with risk factors. Yeah, I just wanted to highlight because it really, it's amazing when like the day after a drug is available and you want it in your clinic and get it into Epic and you're moving and then you're like, oh, this is not the patient that was in the trial because no pregnant women are in the trial and you know there, there's a lot that goes into uh, the next day. So maybe we can focus speaking about thinking about the patient and the whole patient. Maybe you can talk, we talk, use the word of interprofessional, but this concept of multidisciplinary integrated care in GI, why is this important? Great, thank you. Thank you, Marla, for the uh, transition. Um, and so let's talk, just spend the last few minutes talking about why um, we should think about multidisciplinary care. And I think we spent a lot of time talking about how to monitor someone, what medication to start, and, and we've started to get into thinking about the patient themselves, but I think that's really where multidisciplinary care is going to help providers meet the patient where they, where they are, because we, as, as clinicians, we spend a lot of time thinking about the medication and medication management as we should. That patient is thinking about how this disease is going to affect their life, what they should be eating all day, every day, um, how it can affect their, um, their family and their job, and so I think thinking about how you can bring that into your practice, um, I think is the point of multidisciplinary care. So let's th just talk through this a little bit. So, um, you know, patients with IBD, we know are at high risk for malnutrition. They report lack of dietary strategies. When you look at um, studies, patients, very few patients say that they really know, they have very good knowledge. And actually when you add, when there was a, a survey look asking a GI providers how much they knew about it, and they knew very little so, as well. So we need to think about a space to give patients an expert um, understanding of nutrition. And, and there was a question in here about patients ask me if I can just use diet if I'm failing a medication. Um, and I think 
having a nutrition team, a, diet, a dietitian support in any little way, shape, or form, however you can make that happen within your practice, is very important to help the patient frame what they should be eating, frame how they should be doing that, minimizing the risk of restrictive eating, because I think we are realizing over time that's becoming a bigger problem, not just in our IBD patients, but you know, in community in general, but really helping them understand how to do it well. Understand also that we have no data to show that just dietary management itself outside of enteral nutrition is going to change their disease course. We don't have that, although it can help their, um, their quality of life, fatigue, we've seen that with the DINE study. So framing that as a provider and then offering the support um, on the back end with someone to really dig in with uh, what's happening on a daily basis it can be very effective. And this is not something that you need for every patient. Um, but I think just exploring that and figuring out how you can do that within your practice is extremely um, important. We know mental health is, a, is a, such a big uh, component of patients um, who have inflammatory bowel disease. There's, their risk of having a psychological comorbidity is two times higher than patients who are in the general population. We also know that this affects um, their perceived disease activity, their trips to the emergency department, their risk of hospitalization, surgery, and if they're going to take your drug. So we know that a psychological comorbidity increases the likelihood of medication non-adherence. So if we're going to, I could write your IL 1223 all day long, but if you're not going to take it, um, it's not going to be helpful. So, so starting to think about how you can um, improve mental health support and increasingly, uh, you know, um, Marla has things like trellis. Increasingly, we're trying to find ways to do this outside of, um, outside of necessarily a mental health provider because we also know that there's critical shortages of this. And, um, and so thinking about how you can get your, your patient into that. Um, and I think I would say you don't have to have an answer today, but just start to, start, start to put that into the idea framework for your team because I think your team is really important in helping you figure this out as well. And we know disparities exist about this. This is something I think we need to, to, as a community, think about a little bit more and start to try to move this needle. We know people have a difficulty accessing specialists. There is a huge concern for cost of health care, and there are insurance-driven uh, differences in outcomes. So we as a, you know, I don't think we're going to have answers today, but we, under, we know we deal with this all day, every day when we see different patients and clinic, and, and it's OK we as a healthcare system need to try to move that needle and you and in your little every little step that you take to help these patients in different ways is extremely important um, you know we don't have we could talk about this all day long but what is team based care i think the important thing for me is there are some um, places that are starting to try to define this a little bit better for us. The British, British Society of Gastroenterology has um, consensus guidelines. When I, for me, what's important is that as um, providers in, the, in wherever you're practicing, you have bits of this already. So you, you, have, you are doing team-based care with your nurse or um, you know, uh, your surgeon that you work with, a dietitian, however, your, your pharmacist or a team. So you're doing it already. So I think what's important to understand is a lot of us already have that. So just start to frame that up and think about how I can streamline it and really figure out who, what, pay, how I can use these team members um, for the patient that really needs it. Um, and we know that if we do give this team-based care, we can improve outcomes. There is increasing data to show that when we do this, the, dramatically, um, you know, someone, a patient goes through a, a resilience-based program with Dr. Kiefer, and it's a 50% drop in emergency department visits. It, th these are dramatic changes, and it's not medication. Um, it's a support system that we're starting to give to patients. We're reducing hospitalizations. We're improving quality of life and depression scores, which can help them long term. So what does it kind of come down to? When I, when I think about a multidisciplinary team, what are we really doing? We're trying to help the patient move behavior change. So they've had a long history of um, you know, mental health issues and maybe haven't dealt with it, or they, ha they need to think about their diet a little bit differently. 
a team-based care is going to help. That is not something that you can do. First of all, it's extremely difficult to behavior change. We have a, the NIH launched an entire um, strategy to try to study this, and it's extremely difficult. So number one, I think we, we need to understand that we need a lot of people to help us do that. Um, and, and, but I think these team-based care models can start to help us push some of these behavior changes a little bit in that direction. So when I think about that, that's what we're really trying to help our patients do. So um, I, when I think about how can I modify a disease behavior in a short clinic visit, um, you know, some of the things that I think practically we could start thinking about as providers is just really dig into, I have a patient who needs dietary help, how am I going to do that? So, Go home, make a plan about that little piece. One um, way to think about mental health support, am I going to start looking into um, referral strategies or even some um, online-based care for patients? If you're thinking about how can I help understand who's at risk for mental health disorders, a, a lot of EMRs have the capability to help you do this pretty simply. PHQ2 can help you evaluate for depression um, in a very simple way so that you can figure out who you need to talk to. You don't need to do this for everyone. Um, and when you think about health behavior change, you know, patients don't like to be told what to do. Um, you know, why are you, why are you making me do these labs? So helping them come up with the strategies themselves will tell me how we can help you get to this next step. Um, when you think about core behavior changes, or long-term behavior change, it really, you need to link it to a core value. What's, what's the most important thing for you? Is this, you know, getting out on the golf course, going to, um, to, to play baseball with your kids, something like that, that really can help. And if you make a little goal, just write it down so you can talk to the patient the, the next time they come and give them um, some positive feedback. So now that I've talked about SMART goals, we're going to end um, because we hope that we can give you some SMART goals to go home with, some specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely goals. So think about in your treatment practices how to implement uh, treat-to-target strategies using Stride 2. How can you do that? Little treatment, little things that you can start to think about. I'm going to consciously think about how I'm going to add fecal calprotectin into my treatment practice or CRP. Um, incorporate available therapy when you are positioning a biologic. Really think about it. Don't just pick the same drug that you've always picked. Maybe think about what patient is going to be best for what. And then also just start to move the needle a little bit when you're thinking about um, care models for your um, teams and how you can start to take that um, integrative approach. So. I want to thank you so much. Um, I think we're, out of, uh, we're yeah. almost out of time. So we're, we're at 0, .00, zero, zero, zero time. so we're out of time. <laughs> so um, just a few housekeeping things to end. Um, just a reminder, you know, we've received a lot of great questions. I'm happy to farm out any. If anyone wants to come and, and uh, ask us any questions, please do so. Um, you can keep submitting your comments and questions by uh, clicking the Ask Question tab, and you can also tweet it to, to C, tweet to CME Outfitters. Um, if you have any colleagues who missed today's live program, this activity will be available actually on, a, on the Gastro Hub, Gastroenterology Hub, on the CME Outfitters website, which also has additional uh, resources for uh, both clinicians and for patients, actually. So I'd love to uh, thank both of you so much for being a part of something that I think was really educational and fabulously done. Uh, could not have done it without you. Thank you to CME Outfitters for their assistance and um, for helping us get through it. And also to receive last, oops, say last point, to receive C CME or CE credit for this activity, please complete the post-test um, and evaluation online and uh, click on Request Credit tab to complete the process and print your certificate. Thank you again for spending your lunchtime with us, and we hope you enjoy the rest of the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.